"Alfred," said Tom Brangwen, "keep your remarks till afterwards, and then we'll thank you for them. There's very little else on earth but marriage. You can talk about making money, or saving souls. You can save your own soul, seven times over, and you may have a mint of money, but your soul goes gnawing, 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 and it says there's something it must have. In heaven there is no marriage, but on earth there is marriage. Else heaven drops out, and there's no bottom to it. Just hark you now, said Frank's wife. Go on, Thomas, said Alfred sardonically. If we've got to be angels, went on Tom Brangwen, haranguing the company at large, and if there is no such thing as a man nor a woman amongst them, then it seems to me as a married couple makes one angel. It's the brandy, said Alfred Brangwen wearily. For, said Tom Brangwen, and the company was listening to the conundrum, an angel can't be less than a human being, and if it was only the soul of a man minus the man, then it would be less than a human being. Decidedly, said Alfred, and a laugh went round the table. But Tom Brangwen was inspired. An angel's got to be more than a human being, he continued. So I say, an angel is the soul of a man and woman in one. They rise united at the judgment day as one angel. Praising the Lord, said Frank. Praising the Lord, repeated Tom. And what about the women left over? asked Alfred, jeering. The company was getting uneasy. That I can't tell. How do I know as there is anybody left over at Judgment Day? Let that be. What I say is that when a man's soul and a woman's soul unites together, that makes an angel. I don't know about souls. I know as one plus one makes three sometimes, said Frank. But he had the laugh to himself. Bodies and souls... It's the same, said Tom. And what about your missus, who was married afore you knew her? asked Alfred, set on edge by this discourse. That I can't tell you. If I am to become an angel, it'll be my married soul, and not my single soul. It'll not be the soul of me when I was a lad, for I hadn't a soul as would make an angel then. I can always remember, said Frank's wife, when our Harold was bad, he did nothing but see an angel at the back of the looking glass. Look, mother, he said, at that angel. There isn't no angel, my duck, I said, but he wouldn't have it. I took looking glass off of the dressing table, but it made no difference. He kept on saying it was there. My word, it did give me a turn. I thought for sure as I'd lost him. I can remember, said another man, Tom's sister's husband. My mother gave me a good hiding once, for saying I'd got an angel up my nose. She seed me poking, and she said, What are you poking at your nose for? Give over. There's an angel up it, I said and she fetched me such a wipe. But there was. We used to call them thistle things angels as wafts about. And I'd pushed one of these up my nose for some reason or other. It's wonderful what children will get up their noses, said Frank's wife. I can remember our Hemi. She shoved one of them bluebell things out at the middle of a bluebell, what they call candles, up her nose. And oh, we had some work. I'd seen her sticking them on the end of her nose like, but I never thought she'd be so soft as to shove it right up. She was a girl of eight or more. Oh, my word, we got a crochet hook, and I don't know what... Tom Brangwen's mood of inspiration began to pass away. He forgot all about it, and was soon roaring and shouting with the rest. Outside the wake came, singing the carols. They were invited into the bursting house. They had two fiddles and a piccolo. There in the parlour they played carols, and the whole company sang them at the top of its voice. Only the bride and bridegroom sat with shining eyes and strange, bright faces, and scarcely sang, or only with just moving lips. The wake departed, and the geysers came. There was a loud applause and shouting and excitement as the old mystery play of St. George, in which every man present had acted as a boy, proceeded, with banging and thumping of club and dripping pan. By Jove, I got a crack once when I was playing Beelzebub, said Tom Brangwen, his eyes full of water with laughing. It knocked all the sense out of me as you'd crack an egg. But I tell you, when I come to, I played old Johnny Roger with St. George. I did that. He was shaking with laughter. Another knock came at the door. There was a hush. It's the cab, said someone from the door. Walk in, shouted Tom Brangwen, and a red-faced, grinning man entered. 
Now you two get yourselves ready and off to blanket fair, shouted Tom Brangwen. Strike a daisy, but if you're not off like a blink of lightning, you shanna go, you'll sleep separate. Anna rose silently and went to change her dress. Will Brangwen would have gone out, but Tilly came with his hat and coat. The youth was helped on. Well, here's luck, my boy, shouted his father. When that's in fire, let it frizzle, admonished his uncle Frank. Fair and softly does it, fair and softly does it, cried his aunt, Frank's wife, contrary. You don't want to fall over yourself, said his uncle by marriage. You're not a bull at a gate. Let a man have his own road, said Tom Brangwen testily. Don't be so free of your advice. It's his wedding this time, not yours. He don't want many signposts, said his father. There's some roads a man has to be led, and there's some roads a boss-eyed man can only follow with one eye shut. But this road can't be lost by a blind man, nor a boss-eyed man, nor a cripple. And he's neither, thank God. Don't be so sure of your walking powers, cried Frank's wife. There's many a man gets no further than halfway, nor can't to save his life, let him live forever. Why, how do you know, said Alfred. It's plain enough in th looks are some, retorted Lizzie, his sister-in-law. The youth stood with a faint, half-hearing smile on his face. He was tense and abstracted. These things, or anything, scarcely touched him. Anna came down in her day-dress, very elusive. She kissed everybody, men and women. Will Brangwen shook hands with everybody, kissed his mother, who began to cry, and the whole party went surging out to the cab. The young couple were shut up. Last injunctions shouted at them. Drive on, shouted Tom Brangwen. The cab rolled off. They saw the light diminish under the ash trees. Then the whole party, quietened, went indoors. They'll have three good fires burning, said Tom Brangwen, looking at his watch. I told Emma to make em up at nine, and then leave the door on the latch. It's only half past. They'll have three fires burning, and lamps lighted, and Emma will have warmed the bed with warming pan, so I should think they'll be all right. The party was much quieter. They talked of the young couple. She said she didn't want a servant in, said Tom Brangwen. The house isn't big enough. She'd always have the creature under her nose. Emma will do what is wanted of her, and they'll be to themselves. It's best, said Lizzie. You're more free. The party talked on slowly. Brangwen looked at his watch. Let's go and give him a carol, he said. We shall find the fiddles at the Cock and Robin. Aye, come on, said Frank. Alfred rose in silence. The brother-in-law and one of Will's brothers rose also. The five men went out. The night was flashing with stars. Sirius blazed like a signal at the side of the hill. Orion, stately and magnificent, was sloping along. Tom walked with his brother Alfred. The men's heels rang on the ground. It's a fine night, said Tom. Aye, said Alfred. Nice to get out. Aye. The brothers walked close together, the bond of blood strong between them. Tom always felt very much the junior to Alfred. It's a long while since you left home, he said. Aye, said Alfred. I thought I was getting a bit oldish, but I'm not. It's the things you've got as gets worn out. It's not you yourself. Why, what's worn out? Most folks as I've anything to do with, as has anything to do with me, they all break down. You've got to go on by yourself, if it's only to perdition. There's nobody else going alongside, even there. Tom Brangwen meditated this. Maybe you was never broken in, he said. No, I never was, said Alfred proudly. And Tom felt his elder brother despised him a little. He winced under it. Everybody's got a way of their own, he said stubbornly. It's only a dog as hasn't. And them as can take what they give and give what they take, they must go by themselves. Or get a dog as'll follow em. They can do without the dog, said his brother. And again Tom Brangwen was humble, thinking his brother was bigger than himself. But if he was, he was. And if it were finer to go alone, it was. He did not want to go for all that. They went over the field, where a thin, keen wind blew round the ball of the hill in the starlight. They came to the stile and to the side of Anna's house. The lights were out, only on the blinds of the rooms downstairs and of a bedroom upstairs, firelight flickered. We'd better leave him alone, said Alfred Brangwen. Nay, nay, said Tom. We'll carol him for the last time. And in a quarter of an hour's time, eleven silent, 
rather tipsy men scrambled over the wall and into the garden by the yew trees, outside the windows where faint firelight glowered on the blinds. There came a shrill sound, two violins and a piccolo shrilling on the frosty air. In the fields with their flocks abiding, a commotion of men's voices broke out, singing in ragged unison. Anna Brangwen had started up, listening when the music began. She was afraid. It's the wake, he whispered. She remained tense, her heart beating heavily, possessed with strange, strong fear. Then there came the burst of men's singing, rather uneven. She strained still, listening. It's Dad, she said in a low voice. They were silent, listening. And my father, he said. She listened still, but she was sure. She sank down again into bed, into his arms. He held her very close, kissing her. The hymn rambled on outside, all the men singing their best, having forgotten everything else under the spell of the fiddles and the tune. The firelight glowed against the darkness in the room. Anna could hear her father singing with gusto. Yeah. Aren't they silly? she whispered. And they crept closer, closer together, hearts beating to one another. And even as the hymn rolled on, they ceased to hear it. Thank you. 